Today we're going to talk about Ed Kemper. And from May 1973 to April 1974, he killed 10 people, including his mother. And that was while he was on parole for killing his grandparents. Greg, why don't you tell us about the uh, videos we're going to watch? Yeah, so these videos come from a documentary called Murder, No Apparent Motive in 1984. It was about serial killers and FBI behavioral science profilers. These are some of the best interviews from that video. Here's the piece you should know. He killed his grandparents at 15 years old and was incarcerated until 21 in a state mental hospital. They declared him a paranoid schizophrenic until he convinced them that he was rehabbed and was released from prison. He was on parole, on probation, as you said, Scott, when this happened. When they asked him why he killed his grandmother, he said because he wanted to know how it felt, and he killed his grandfather so he wouldn't be angry with him about killing his grandmother. Well, I'm not an expert. I'm not an authority. I'm someone who has been a murderer for almost 20 years. Can you say how many people might be doing crimes like you were doing? It would be a guess, but it's not. It's far more than 35. It isn't that impossible in this society. It happens. Are there more people? They didn't give up. Or how he, many? she didn't give up. I did. I came in out of the cold. And what I'm saying is there are some people who prefer it in the cold. Good people see. A nice guy. Did you like Kemper? I like Kemper. You were able to appear like an ordinary person, non-threatening to... I lived as an ordinary person most of my life, even though I was living a parallel and increasingly sick life, other life. One victim let me back in the car. I locked myself out. She opened the door for me. My gun was under the seat. What in the hell am I doing telling you that? Am I looking, am I, am I a masochist? Am I looking to be tormented further? I'm trying to show you just how awful this got, how commanding these rages got. I was raging inside. There was just incredible energies, positive and negative, uh, depending on a mood that would trigger one or the other. And outside, I looked troubled at times. Other times I looked moody. Uh, other times, perfectly serene, not very sane. But again, people weren't even aware of what was happening. All right, Greg, what do you got? So let's start by talking about resistance to interrogation. Everybody asks me always what I can tell them. Let me tell you this. None of it works. You're not believable. And so the biggest struggle for a person who's trying to resist interrogation is to appear to be cooperative and helpful. Ding, ding, ding. That's who we're looking at right here. Wait, and I'll show you where as we go through. But this guy's soppy, sincere. Wait till we get through. You will be able to see it as clear as day. It starts right here, though. He's doing these long vowels. I'm not an expert, an authority. Listen to those lengthened vowels he's doing, and he pulls with his eyes as he's doing it. This guy's not stupid. He's been in He's been in the system since he's 15 years old. He's heard psychologists say paranoid schizophrenic. I'm sure he played that. Whatever he needed, he learned all the right language. And I think we're going to see it all through this thing. When he's shaking his head, no, he's not predicting his message. He is supporting his message when he said they didn't give up. He does, however, show disdain. In disdain, we see that drawing back of the mouth and that back when he's talking about himself as a nice guy because he knew he wasn't. I think that he likes to teach. He likes to pontificate. And this guy, if he does a good job, all he has to do is to go, really? Oh, tell me more. Play naive. We play it. We pray on the person's natural tendency you want to want to teach. And it works. And you'll get to see this. This guy's a celebrity of some sort already by this point, by 1984. And we're going to see him just pontificate about crime and those things. Chase, what do you got? I really agree with you here. He frequently refers to expertise and authority in a lot of situations. And I think this speaks to a mindset of a person who confuses what expertise is. I can promise you that killing people for 20 years makes you more of an expert in killing than every professor who spent five times as long doing stuff. I think there's a massive difference between skill and experience and someone who has information and data. So he's got a lot that nobody who studies psychopaths has. And I think that there's a genuine desire to communicate the full experience of truth here, the full expression of truth. He's trying to come across really clean. You can see this in the way he's comfortable editing his language to make sure it's accurate. 
There's no hesitancy or stress when he's editing that information. And we see a little bit of self-soothing behavior touching his wrist. And I think this is more likely to be the presence of all the cameras that are around and not the subject matter that's being discussed. And while he's talking about rages, he shakes his head. And this might show us a little bit about his mindset, like he's trying to shake it out of his head. And there's a potential that he resisted these rages and that accentuated by this hand up here to kind of help right there. There's a small gesture like he's trying to pull it out of his head. And if I was the interviewer here, I might make this gesture again later after a few minutes when asking a follow-up question about these rages. I might do that exact same gesture that I saw him do. And just finally, notice the lack of ownership in all the language here. Uh, a mood, not my mood. These rages, not my rages. And how commanding they get. So these rages are now commanding me to do something which is highly dissociated. And we're going to see some more of this uh, along the way. Scott, what do you got? I agree. He he disassociates himself with just about everything. It's like it happened to someone else. This is why I thought it was paranoid uh, schizophrenic when it, as we first started going through these things. Um, I've ended up on another spot with that now. But yeah, I, I agree with you. It, it's he's uh, he's not owning anything. He's not taking anything as his own, as his own. It's almost like he's talking about somebody else. His blink rate is really low. He seems really relaxed. Doesn't seem like too bothered about talking about this. He's fairly non-expressive facially. And but he has these little smiles peppered throughout his conversation during this. There are no visual, visual, visual or audible cues of stress. Everything sounds fairly normal. And uh, even compared to as we go through this, I'm using that as the baseline, which which as a viewer, you don't have yet because you haven't seen all those. And when he says it happens, he uses his assertive face like he knows something like he's he's sure about that. He uses his illustrators sparingly. He doesn't use those very often at all. And he's very aware of how he's looking to other people. These are all the things that that point toward the narcissistic personality, obviously, and by these choice of words and, and putting everything bad on somebody else. Uh, and we'll see how deep that goes in just a few minutes. He's got his, his arm resting with his hand up, and that suggests he's comfortable, but at the same time being dominant in that situation. I think the most fascinating part of this is they got George R. R. Martin to interview him for this. I don't know if you all are familiar with who that is. Do you know who that is? No. <laughs> but I'm going to assume that's a joke. <laughs> he looks just who like is him. George R. 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 Mountain? Who, who was he? Martin. He must He's a writer. Author. Uh, yeah. He wrote Game of Thrones and some other stuff. All right. Uh, Chase, what Oh, you I see. Okay. Yeah. 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 I only got oh, through right. the first 10 minutes of Game, Game of Thrones. So. Oh, okay. So, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. What have I got? Well, number one, that I'm clearly not a Game of Thrones fan uh, ever. Uh, take that wherever you go. Look, first of all, like, he's super calm. That's the main main piece of body language as far as I'm concerned. Like, he kind of does nothing. I mean, everybody's picked up on some really good fine points of that, so it isn't like he does nothing. But in the grand scheme of things, he really does hardly do anything. So it's a good job with the behavior panel and not the body language panel, because I think we'd run out of <laughs> stuff pretty quickly. Um, net net for me of his story is that society creates a space where a guy like him can commit multiple murders because people are relatively foolish. I think that's uh, underneath what his story is, that it isn't, his, it isn't his fault. Yes, he has these rages and he goes into that, but ultimately he's suggesting that situations present themselves and those situations even re-present themselves when they really shouldn't. People uh, allow him in the vehicle when it shouldn't have happened. It's other people's foolishness. He puts himself across, in my opinion, as something heroic. He says, I came in from the cold. That's, that's Le Carre. He's a double agent. He's a Richard Burton figure. He's heroic. So this has all the markings, like you, Scott, you, you know, I, I was surprised at that, that early diagnosis at, at the start, because I went, what? How did somebody diagnose that? Especially the young 
at a young age. Uh, there's that for a, for a start. Uh, but also, I instantly see something which is really quite narcissistic there, which is everybody else is at, at fault. <laughs> yeah, I'm a bit of a hero, actually. I think imagine you're Burton and, 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 uh, and, a, and a really cool kind of double agent going on there. So, so look, let's see how this can continue because early days we got a lot of great videos to go through let's see what happens well if you don't know who we are we're the behavior panel and i'm scott rouse i'm a body language expert and analyst and i trained law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language and i created the number one online body language course body language tactics with greg hartley mark I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. Help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes. I did 20 years in the U.S. military. I wrote the number one best-selling book on behavior profiling, influence, and persuasion, and I transform people's lives through teaching those skills today. Greg? I'm Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor, written 10 books on body language and behavior, and I spend most of my time in business. Well, I'm not an expert. I'm not an authority. I'm someone who has been a murderer for almost 20 years. Can you say how many people might be doing crimes like you were doing? It would be a guess, but it's not. It's far more than 35. It isn't that impossible in this society. It happens. Are there more people? They didn't give up. Uh, how he, many? she didn't give up. I did. I came in out of the cold. And what I'm saying is there are some people who prefer it in the cold. Good people see. A nice guy. Did you like Kemper? I like Kemper. You were able to appear like an ordinary person, non-threatening to... I lived as an ordinary person most of my life even though I was living a parallel and increasingly sick life, other life. One victim let me back in the car. I locked myself out. She opened the door for me. My gun was under the seat. What in the hell am I doing telling you that? Am I looking, am I, am I a masochist? Am I looking to be tormented further? I'm trying to show you just how awful this got, how commanding these rages got. I was raging inside. There was just incredible energies, positive and negative, uh, depending on a mood that would trigger one or the other. And outside, I looked troubled at times. Other times, I looked moody. Uh, other times, perfectly serene. Not very sane. But again, people weren't even aware of what was happening. You were involved in the campus because your mother worked there. Yes. I was also involved in killing co-eds because my mother was associated with college work, college co-eds, women, and had had a very strong and violently outspoken position on men for much of my upbringing. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and, and very sad woman. I hated her. But I wanted to love my mother, and I watched the alcohol increase, I watched her social life drop off, I watched her get bizarre. She had terrible pain from her life, earlier life, her upbringing, uh, a failed marriage with my father. I'm a constant reminder of that failure. I hate to distill it down into such uh, into one word realities like that. There's a lot that leads into that happening, but that is what happened. They represented not what my mother was, but what she liked, what she coveted, what was important to her. And I was destroying it. Okay, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is going to start his mantra, his thing. I, Mark, you started it before where you said he was saying, look, people are idiots, people are fools. People are going to play a part. But more importantly, his mother and his father and all of that is going to play a part. His brow goes down, his eyes narrow. That's anger. And he, we, he's doing that when he starts to talk about his mother's dislike of men. He's starting to illustrate his central message. He does great requests for approval, meaning I'm raising my brow, trying to get you to give me a, so I can keep moving along with the story at her life, at miserable and at father. Interestingly, one of the psychologists when he was young or maybe later said he was simply punishing the abandonment of his mother and father because his mother got remarried or they got divorced 
His mother made him live with her, he ran away, moved in with his father. His father sent him to live with his grandparents and killed his grandparents. So, look, this is this guy can preach whatever message he wants with all this soppy thing he's doing. But listen to what he's saying, not what he thinks he's saying. He's got a message to get out. His face tightens. His brow goes down and his mouth narrows when he's talking about these people. And he says, it's the way I was raised and, and, and. But if you go back and look in his history, when he was a young child, he abused animals. He did all the stuff, all the earmarks that we find of psychopaths. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, he's got this, this because of this mantra. And Greg, what did you say this documentary was originally called? Uh, it was called Murder Without a... Uh, hold on one second. No apparent motive. Murder. No apparent Cold motive. Home. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No apparent motive. And 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 I think this is a theme that's gonna gonna come along because he is trying to put down an apparent motive. He says, "Look, m multiple murders because of this." And he's got mother, hate, love, men, sick, angry, failed, failure, alcohol, social life, bizarre, pain, marriage, father. He 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 puts down a whole bunch of external factors that basically go, look, multiple murders because of because of this. And so, you know, without a motive, no, he's put down. Here, here's your motives. I've given you the, the, the jigsaw puzzle, perfect put together in a very, very simple idea. In fact, he admits that he's simple. He says, um, you know, it, it sounds very simple. Yeah, it does sound very simple. Does it sound overly simplified does it fa sound like he's trying to offer us something where we go oh yeah because you because your mother yeah your mother was a bit was a bit nasty wasn't she i mean yeah mums can be some mums can be terrible 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 people absolutely absolutely but um but that sounds too simple for me and he admits that it's too simple so is it more complex is it more complex than that and i think greg you're hinting at it that there's some early uh some some early signals that it is uh, it is uh more complex than simplicity that he puts forward he says you know there's a one word there's a one word word motive for this and i think his word is mother really uh it is it is super kind of freudian isn't it and 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 that's that's a that's kind of a, a good kind of whistle that people might jump on and go brilliant super simple case wrapped up here we go nice serial killer sorted i think it's a little more complex uh chase what do you got on this one yeah i have to agree watching this this morning i don't know a whole lot about the case uh, uh to be honest right here when he's saying i was involved in killing coeds this is more distancing language and it's interesting here he's copying the word involved from the interviewer and he borrowed this language from him and this is a great method to make somebody feel like you're answering their question and i'm sure he's developed this skill rather than learned it from some kind of training he describes his mom as sick angry hungry and sad i was really curious about the hungry part i, I would love to have been there and asked him about this but I think this is the same reference that he loosely makes to himself. And if you listen to these four words over the next few clips, you're going to hear him describing himself as sick, angry, hungry, and sad. And you hear him build a case for destroying everything that was important to his mother. He wants to destroy everything that was important to her. I'd like to know what she destroyed that was important to him. And I don't know how a lot about this case but if you do let me know in the comments because i think this is an example of what i call a re reflection aggression and reflection descriptions are right here when he's describing all the part he hates about himself and how ugly they look in other people and how if he can get rid of it in someone else then it might leave him too scott what do you got all right, I see what you're saying. I think the things that, that we're, we're seeing reflect back when he was a kid and he was a mean little kid and she was getting after him, trying to make him mind. I think it goes back that far. There's some other things that happened where we'll hear him talk about some chickens and things like that. But I think he was mad at her or hated her because she tried to make him mind all the time because apparently he was out of control a lot of the time. He wouldn't be a, a good kid or a good person. And he blames, puts all of his transgressions on his mother, every single thing. And you're right, that's the recurring theme throughout this. It's, it's all of his mother's fault. And Mark, like you were saying, it's he's the hero here. And it's all because he does these things because his mother 
quote unquote made him do it. It's what he's trying to make it sound like, but she didn't. And you can, and I think George R. R. Martin did a great uh, interview here because at the beginning, when he asks that first question, he pauses and then it hits him. And you can see him pop into that thing and start blaming his mom for all this. That's when all that stuff starts coming out. I mean, he talks about killing co wids and women. We see a little duping delight there, just a little bit. And then he goes on a deep dive again about how his mother's a bad person. Talks about all the drinking, the crazy behavior, all those things. And, and I think he does this uh, to this redirection to her every time, obviously, to protect his ego. Because when you're dealing with a psychopath, the ego is the most important thing to him. Or a hardcore clinical narcissist, that's the thing they protect the most. Once you brush up against that ego and do something bad and make him mad, they will wait forever to get you back. They will wait and wait and wait, and they'll see their shot and take it. And I think it goes back to his childhood where she was trying to make him mine, maybe spanked him, maybe tried doing stuff, but he was still out of hand, and that's one of the reasons he hated her guts so much. You were involved in the campus because your mother worked there. Yes. I was also involved in killing co-eds because my mother was associated with college work, college co-eds, women, and had had a very strong and violently outspoken position on men for much of my upbringing. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. And I watched the alcohol increase. I watched her social life drop off. I watched her get bizarre. She had terrible pain from her life earlier life, her upbringing, uh, a failed marriage with my father. I'm a constant reminder of that failure. I hate to distill it down into such, uh, into one word realities like that. There's a lot that leads into that happening, but that is what happened. They represented not what my mother was, but what she liked, what she coveted, what was important to her, and I was destroying it. Why did you actually kill the girls? My frustration my inability to communicate socially, sexually. I wasn't impotent, but emotionally I was impotent. I was scared to death of failing in male-female relationships. I knew absolutely nothing about that whole area. Even if just sitting down and talking with the young lady. I need to be able to really communicate, and ironically enough, that's why I began picking people up. And I'm picking up young women, and I'm going, a little bit farther each time. It's a daring kind of a thing. At first, there wasn't a gun. I'm driving along. We go to a vulnerable place where there aren't people watching, where I could act out, and I say, no, I can't. And then a gun is in the car, hidden. And this craving, this awful, raging, eating feeling inside. I could feel it consuming my insides this fantastic passion uh, it was overwhelming me it was like drugs it was like alcohol a little isn't enough at first it is and as you adjust to that psychologically and physically you take more and more and more it's the same process so it finally came down to the thing of do I dare bring this gun out already realizing if that gun comes out something has to happen it was going to happen I didn't see it then, but it was going to happen. I was playing a dangerous game with a loaded gun that got us all. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I, I, I spotted some body language. There's some body language in there, and, but it's in a weird place. So there's concern with him on the question until he starts to answer, and then all the concern clears up. And so I'd expect it to be somewhat the other way around because... because um, uh, his story is about frustration, inability, he's scared, need to be able to communicate. I would expect concern and frustration and, and some kind of body language around all of those kind of words. And there's nothing. There's just concern when he when he's listening to the question, is that he doesn't know what question is coming, is that he doesn't like to be not to be in charge, and everything kind of softens up when he's in charge. It's the wrong way round for me. Anyway, I saw some body language, so fantastic. I've fulfilled that part of my session for you. Uh, what else do we get from him? Well, we get um, uh, 
uh, craving, addiction, passion, uh, fantastic, overwhelming, like drugs, alcohol. So he's doing the whole I got addicted thing. And he starts off with it was like drugs or alcohol. So he does a simile, but that very soon dissolves into um, a metaphor because he says you take more and more now it's not it's like you take more and more he just says you take more and more so now he's ill with an addiction he has an illness it's not him anymore it's an illness that he has he's still uh, the hero there and so we get um we get we get it displaced into an it we get stephen king's it uh, again it was going to happen i didn't see it so that's total abdication of responsibility he's he's ill um he 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 can't control it it creeps up him from behind we should all feel sorry for him because it's an it he has zero responsibility for this so i would instantly go this is antisocial and so we have an antisocial personality here no no denying it as far as i can see uh that's what we got on that one uh greg what do you got yeah i actually like this one a lot because it starts to show him through look you can cover and you can do all of this soppy sincerity and do all of those things you want but if your brain is trying to say what it thinks while your mouth is doing what you're willing it to do you, it, it's hard to cover those up so when he says something about the girls you see that chin engage, that chin boss is engaged, and Chase, I'm sure you'll talk about it. We talk about it all the time. So we usually associate that with grief or with, uh, or, or, or with, um, I'm sorry, with grief or with shame. And if you pay attention to him, usually we then look at the rest of the face to know which it is. There's no grief muscle. There's nothing else involved. So I'm just going to call that shame. And Chase, Chase, you may have a different opinion when you see it. He says sexuality, he does a minor lip compression. Where This is the beginning of something we're going to see a lot of. That's withheld emotion, I think. And then he j quickly has to jump in there. And not that I was sexually impotent, like it's a point of pride for him. His chin comes up a bit. And now we start to see the mask slip or whatever you want to call it. There's some mixed messaging. He goes from, I picked these girls up to expand my ability to communicate. But then he quickly shifts to, say, daring and carrying a gun. I think that's his brain saying what he what he actually was doing while he's trying to cover it with some kind of soppy sincerity at the top. Then you get that. I, I honestly don't think that he had any intent of telling you the truth. I think that's just his operating system underneath coming out and saying what actually happened. Um, that's a lot of message shifting there to go between those two different messages and then to go to some rationalizing why it happened. I think he's just trying to win over this guy. He's socially aware enough, antisocial personality, yes, but socially aware enough that he's doing what it takes. Listen to the shift. I'm driving. We go. A gun is in. No connection to him whatsoever. I'm driving, but we go. We didn't go. You drove those people somewhere to kill them. A gun is in there. How the hell did a gun get there? It was going to happen. It got us all. Hmm, how did it get us all? No, you kill people. You drug them down this thing. But what he's, where he's talking about people feeling this, Mark, I think he's doing exactly what you're saying. He's throwing at everybody else drinks have this problem. He's just more of the same. He's doing what this guy wants to hear. Scott, what do you got? All right. When he's describing how it's a drug, what he's talking about is is this when psychopaths actually start feeling something because they usually don't because they've got a problem with their amygdala. Either it doesn't work, it's damaged or there isn't one. The only thing they get a, they get any kind of feeling whatsoever is is something that would scare us half to death, you know, from jumping out of planes or doing something. And when he does something like kill somebody, that's such a big deal. It gooses his adrenaline and it gives him a feeling. He actually feels something. So I think he became what he says addicted to that actual feeling something, which he hasn't felt anything or not much up to that point. Like you were saying, Greg, when he killed his grandfather. He, or his grandmother, he wanted to see what if what it felt like to do that. See if it gave him, if it made him feel anything. So that's what they're talking about. Or that's what he's talking about in that situation. He actually did feel something, and he liked feeling something. And that's maybe the only thing that did that did it for him. Now, at the beginning of this, up to this point, his total ch his, his total reasoning for why he killed has changed. Before it was about his mother. Now it's from trying to get back at his mother and uh, for his stunted social skills 
That's what he's blaming on not being able to talk to people, not knowing how to, to act socially. Then he talks about picking up women and not hurting them. But all of a sudden, there's a gun in the car, like you were saying, Greg. Really? You put the gun in the car, man. It just wasn't there all of a sudden. He keeps distancing himself from everything, like he's looking at it in the third person, it's, it's, which is really odd. When he says uh, awful, raging eating, uh, there's a full expression of anger when he says eating at him. So that was that that must be one of his, his key words that triggers him there, or something he thinks about how that's eating at him, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, quite often when you see a, a, a psychopath out in the wild or when they when once they look back on them and see that, they'll see them hunting for these situations where they can make action happen, something that'll that'll give them that adrenaline rush. Uh, for example, the guy who um, the, the doctor who found, found out he had the same brain set up uh, to make a long story short, as a psychopath, would take his family on these these really dangerous trips, like little kids and stuff, on these white rod or rafting trips. You'll see him doing things like that. You'll hear about them. Your dad did what? But they won't come into the normal world out here in the wild and hurt anybody or anything. I think that has has to do with it, the way they were raised around. A lot of people that took care of them, loved them. And they didn't see a lot of violence. Whereas psychopaths, like you have those, I always use examples of ISIS and those types that are in those they see violence growing up and it's not a problem for them at all it's it's natural for them to to be violent in this case i don't think it was it was natural for him to be, to be violent but i think it goes back to his mom being what he thought was being mean to him she's simply trying to get him to mind and that made him mad and when he started doing stuff like well like he did some things when he was younger to animals i think that gave him that rush and gave him that feeling and he just kept moving it up to people at this point it ended up being those girls but he went from blaming everything on his mother to blaming everything on his his stunted social skills at this point. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you guys. When, when I teach criminal profilers or detectives, uh, this is the language pattern shift of a criminal type that we call the intruder victim. And in this sense, the criminal is a victim of intrusive thoughts and feelings. And whether it's true or not, they're either believing this or selling it to the interviewer. doesn't matter. So we use that archetype to describe this as an intruder victim. You can hear throughout this clip how dissociative it is, the guns in the car, this craving, this awful raging, this eating, this feeling, this passion. And he sums it all up in the end with a statement that 100% completely identifies him as the intruder victim. It got us all. And I agree with you, Scott. This is him telling us that the intruder got us all. This is the team pronoun. He identifies himself as another victim in the pool with all the other people. And it's all of this monster that he's kind of describing. This monster is actually going to come out and show its face here in a minute. We're going to get a little more accurate description of this. And I'll tell you how his mother uh, might have helped to make that happen. All right. Oh, Greg wins that one hard, man. Why did you actually kill the girls? My frustration, my inability to communicate socially, sexually. I wasn't impotent, but emotionally I was impotent. I was scared to death of failing in male-female relationships. I knew absolutely nothing about that whole area. Even if just sitting down and talking with the young lady. I need to be able to really communicate. And ironically enough, that's why I began picking people up. And I'm picking up young women. And I'm going a little bit farther each time. It's a daring kind of a thing. At first, there wasn't a gun. I'm driving along. We go to a vulnerable place where there aren't people watching, where I could act out. And I say, no, I can't. And then a gun is in the car, hidden. And this craving, this awful, raging, eating feeling inside. I could feel it consuming my insides. This fantastic passion. Uh, it was overwhelming me. It was like drugs. It was like alcohol. A little isn't enough. At first it is. And as you adjust to that, psychologically and physically, you take more and more and more. It's the same process. So. It finally came down to the thing of, do I dare bring this gun out? Already realizing if that gun comes out, something has to happen. It was going to happen. 
I didn't see it then, but it was going to happen. I was playing a dangerous game with a loaded gun that got us all. On one occasion, Kemper picked up two roommates in Berkeley. And that first killing in May of 72, when that gun was pulled out, I launched it out. For, I had it under my leg, out of sight, parallel to my, to my leg in the seat. It was something that had been thought out in fantasy, acted out, felt out hundreds of times before it ever happened. Kemper drove them at gunpoint to a secluded area near a park. He took one of them into the woods, leaving the second girl tied in the car. I'd just gone through a horrible experience with her roommate stabbing her. And I was in shock because of that. I couldn't believe that it was that way. And I'm walking back there bewildered. I gotta kill her. I can't let her go. She's gonna tell on me. Everybody's gonna get me. She sees the blood on my hands. What are you doing? And she pulled back and she gasped. And I think, whoa, I don't want her to know what happened. I said, your friend got smart with me. She'd been getting really smart with me a lot, but I never hit her. I killed her, but I didn't hit her. I said, your friend got smart with me and I hit her. I think I broke her nose. You better come help. She's about to die. Why, do, why does she have to know that? I couldn't deal with telling her that. And when I attacked her, she didn't at first realize what was happening. It didn't go through. She had very heavy coveralls on. It knocked her right up into the lid of the car, but it didn't pierce the clothing. So it wasn't that swell a knife anyway. I went out and bought a, a pawn shop huge knife. And uh, I kept on just mindlessly attacking. She falls back into the trunk. All right, Chase, what do you got? Right in here, there's more unusual language that reveals his mindset. The gun was pulled out. Uh, but there's smooth and fluid body narration here. His body is assisting and telling us the story and, and how helping us understand the story. So he says it had been thought out. It had been felt out. And when he's saying, I just had been through a horrible experience with her roommate, He's the one who endured the suffering in his mind. His eyebrows are down to mention I never hit her. And as a rule of thumb, eyebrows typically go upward desiring agreement and downward desiring understanding. So I really want you to understand this. I never hit her. I'm, I killed her, but yeah, I'm not the type to hit people. And I think he's frustrated here that her questions are somehow pulling him out of his fantasy. I think this girl or woman questioning him in the back seat of the car, these are just a little alarm clocks interrupting a good dream to him. And I think that upset him more than anything else. And when he goes through any violent action, there's severity softening, which we talk about all the all all the time. All the details about the knife or the violence are gone. And he's distancing, you know, he kept attacking instead of stabbing. And he's what we're really seeing. He's distancing the mask here that he's wearing from the details of the intruder that we just talked about. And we're going to talk about this intruder a lot. So this intruder is this dark force uh, that secretly lives in him uh, that he wants to get it out so much. You saw in the previous video, he's like, dare I use this gun? And then somehow, oh, crap, it's out. I don't know how that gun got out. Now I've got to use it. So it's this dark intruder. So I'm going to call it the intruder if you guys want to join me. If not... Uh, we're not friends anymore. But uh, Scott, what do you have? <laughs> All right. He's, again, he's constantly re removing himself from his actions. And that first killing when the gun was pulled out, it sounds like somebody else doing it. And then he doesn't say, this was something I thought about and acted out hundreds of times. He says, this is something that was thought out and acted out hundreds of times. Again, the severity softening is just, I think that's the real star here is the severity softening. Everything is not him. He's almost viewing it from a third person. That's why I was dealing with that paranoid schizophrenic situation earlier. And from this angle, it looks like he's doing these little single shoulder shrugs, but I think he's uh, illustrating at that point, and we can't see his hands, so I think that's what's happening there. Um, he never gets graphic. He never gets into gory details. This is the first time he's talked about blood. And when he says, when I attacked her, when I attacked her, he's actually meaning when he stabbed her. So he's even severity softening there at that point. And 
Apparently, again, that uh, severity softening to me is the star here because that's of the utmost importance to him because he's trying to keep that his what he looks like to everyone else in check. So he looks like a good guy. He's done these horrific things, but he's still coming on like, hey, I'm a great guy. It's not my fault. It's my mom's fault and my inability to socialize properly. Um, and then when he says, I kept mindlessly attacking her and she fell into the trunk. No, you don't fall into a trunk when you're being mindlessly attacked. I think he was... I think he pushed her in there after he was stabbing her. Um, that's what it sounds like to me anyway. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, so um, to your point, Chase and Scott, uh, I'd just gone through a horrible experience. I was in shock. shock. So uh, that's narcissism. So just to show you the difference, like if I look at myself in a mirror, uh, though that is where the, the original story of Narcissus comes from, him looking at himself in a pool. It, it's, it's, you know, narcissism is probably wrongly named because, because that's kind of low rent as opposed to what we've got here, which is this true narcissism where it's not somebody taking selfies. They have killed somebody. They've killed somebody. And now it's all about, yeah, but what about me? Think about the pain that I went through. And of course, the rest of society, because there is something, you know, anti-social about this goes, you shouldn't really be thinking about yourself in this situation. And the true narcissist will go, well, no, actually, I, sh I should. I mean, because it's all about me. And they won't be able to see the sociological side of it. Now, let's move on to this idea of, of paranoia. He thinks to himself, everyone's going to get me everyone's going to get me and so it would be easy to go hey like yeah that's paranoia paranoia everybody's going to get them no but if you murder somebody everybody will be out anybody sensible anybody reasonable anybody in the society will go we got to get that guy and we got to incarcerate him or, or certainly we got to bring down on him the strongest rule that our society has come up with so that isn't paranoia that's narcissism again everybody's gonna get me yeah so uh there's concern that she didn't at first realize what was happening we see that this furrowed brow concern like she didn't realize what was gonna what was going on it's confusion around that so there's a disassociation for me in, in terms of understanding any empathy anything that's going on in in this other person's head he's literally confused by it so like why why wouldn't she know what's gonna happen why wouldn't she be responding as i would respond so he's he's lacking in two types of of empathy here and there are two big bits of empathy one is emotional empathy and one is cognitive empathy emotional empathy is when you feel the same thing as somebody else often at the same time cognitive empathy is when you can recognize an emotion that somebody's feeling i, I don't feel sad but i go oh i think they're feeling sad right now and i can think about it he can't do either of those things. He's not feeling sad for her and he isn't able to even think somebody else would feel fear or feel something or do something else. He's lacking in the two big buckets of, of emotion there. So again, that leads us strongly down a, down a path to an antisocial personality there. And, and I would steer around uh, paranoia, which again, why at the start when, when he was diagnosed with that, I kind of go, look, not that I have those those qualifications, people way more uh, eminent than myself would have done that. But I wonder why. I wonder why they would have hit on that at that particular point. I'm not sure. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> that was wow. a good one, though. I, you know, I, I, I didn't want to burp on. The, no. So anyway, <laughs> oh, I'm glad I'm last wow. on this to Mark because I'm going to tie everything you have all said together back together because this guy is. We always talk about a mask. This guy has just full bore grabbed his mask and thrown it off. He has no idea he's done it. Even either that or maybe he's just not smart enough to realize it. But when we talk about psychopaths, psychopath 101 is they only see people in the way those people affect them. 
We say psychopaths have no feelings except for these emotions that are related to terror and those kinds of things. Scott, that's the thing you always bring up. Well, if those two things are true, let's start there and say they can't feel what another person feels. This guy just said, hey, look at me. I'm a psychopath because he he illustrates for the first time as he's telling a story fluidly, which we say is honesty and truthfulness. And emphatically, what is he illustrating about? I stabbed her. I did this. I did that. There's not a single element. And Chase, you started with talking about it's about him. There's not a single element of any of these people. Nothing about the person that he's doing this stuff to. When the gun was pulled out, the knife came off of her. It's not because he's being passive in trying to soften in my opinion. He just doesn't know it matters. So he's saying, you know, I did this and I did that. This happened, that happened. And then I had just gone through a horrible experience with a roommate. That's feelings. That's his feelings. He's telling you what he felt. I just gone through all this. I don't even know that he's severity softening. I was in shock. The place he puts the single most emphasis is around it was a cheap knife. More than he puts around this two women he killed. Again, it's just an object. He can't tell the difference. I think what we just saw is this guy just grab his mask and throw it in the trash and not even have any idea he's done that. This is a great one. That's all I got. Oh, man. That was good. <laughs> I have to think about that one. On one occasion, Kemper picked up two roommates in Berkeley. In their first killing in May of 72, when that gun was pulled out, I launched it out. For it. I had it under my leg, out of sight, parallel to my, to my leg in the seat. It was something that had been thought out in fantasy, acted out, felt out hundreds of times before it ever happened. Kemper drove them at gunpoint to a secluded area near a park. He took one of them into the woods, leaving the second girl tied in the car. I just gone through a horrible experience with her roommate stabbing her. And I was in shock because of that. I couldn't believe that it was that way. And I'm walking back there bewildered. I gotta kill her. I can't let her go. She's gonna tell on me. Everybody's gonna get me. She sees the blood on my hands. What are you doing? And she pulled back and she gasped. And I think, whoa, I don't want her to know what happened. I said, your friend got smart with me. She'd been getting really smart with me a lot, but I never hit her. I killed her, but I didn't hit her. I said, your friend got smart with me and I hit her. I think I broke her nose. You better come help. She's about to die. Why, do, why does she have to know that? I couldn't deal with telling her that. And when I attacked her, she didn't at first realize what was happening. It didn't go through. She had very heavy coveralls on. It knocked her right up into the lid of the car, but it didn't pierce the clothing. So it wasn't that swell a knife anyway. I went out and bought a, a pawn shop, huge knife. And uh, I kept on just mindlessly attacking. She falls back into the trunk. I just killed a young woman. I slammed down the lid of the trunk. She isn't dead. She's dying. And I panicked. I thought, I just locked the car keys in it because I can't find them in my pocket. Oh, my God, I locked them in the trunk. I'm kicking on the trunk lid and yanking on it. Oh, no, I don't believe this. I started to run and I tripped over the gun that I'd had in my pants that I had totally forgotten was there. I stopped, I said, stop and think. I collected my wits. Check all your pockets. I picked the gun up, I stuck it back in my pants, now remembering I had one. I checked all my pockets and there's the keys in the back pocket. I never put them in my back pocket. Everyone makes mistakes and that's what we have to hope for. The more mistakes they make, the better, the better their chances. I thought I was pretty slick and went and tripped all over myself, that first two murders. The first 24 hours, there were three clear times I should have been busted, and I wasn't. Because three different individuals or three different groups of people got scared and minded their own business and looked the other way. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so this is really interesting because because now we get a story of panic. So what comes out of this for me is, is serial killers are not criminal masterminds in, in every case. We've got somebody who 
even for them, when they deviate from a usual behavior, there's a cascade of other stuff that happens. So he's tripping over himself, doesn't know where he's put his keys, and he has to get his wits back together, what small amount of wit there, might, there may well be, and get himself sorted out with this. It's just worth remembering for all of us in all our behaviors. Once we start to deviate from our usual patterns, there is a cascade of mistakes that happen. Every time I lose my keys, just like him, every time I lose my keys, I'm like, ah, okay. So what was my my behavior deviance from baseline that's caused me to put my keys in a different place than I always put them because I always put them in one place. So something else down the line has changed. Anyway, interesting for me. Um, but here's where he now goes with this. He's a bit of a clown. He's a bit of an idiot, but he's not as much of a clown or an idiot as the individuals, and the groups who turn a blind eye, who don't respond as they should. Now, maybe he has a has a point, uh, but maybe it's like, well, you know, you're not that bright. You're just hoping that everybody else is just a little less bright than you. And that's how you get away with it for all of us. If you see something, say something. If you see stuff that is out of baseline, if you see some behavior, prove this person wrong and, you know, intervene in some way if it's safe for you. Get somebody else to intervene. Call some kind of authority and go, hey, something odd is, is going on because he might well be right. He might well be right that there's some stupid criminals out there that are just relying on all of us being just that little more stupid than them and that little more just enough will give them a chance uh and again there's the concern in his head he doesn't understand it he can't understand why people would have turned a blind eye as he makes it out now also he's a narcissist so also he's going to make out that everybody else is stupid as well so we can't be entirely reliant on his story but chase what do you got on this one yeah let's talk about that for a second uh he says they got scared and minded their own business and looked the other way if you live in a house with several people and you walk by a full trash can, you might decide right then to snatch it up and take it outside. But it's more likely for most humans it, that you'll assume someone else might walk by and do it in a few minutes. If you live by yourself, you do not have these tendencies because it's just you. And this is called diffusion of responsibility. It's also called the bystander effect. And it's a very scary social phenomenon where we're less likely to help people the more people that are around us. In 1964 in Queens, a woman was stabbed to death in front of 38 witnesses. People didn't call the police because they just assumed someone else would do it. These were real witnesses. And we have a tendency to do what the crowd's doing, and it's 10 times more powerful to do what the crowd's doing than you might actually think. We also have a tendency to assume somebody else is going to take care of situations when there's multiple people around. This is the reason these people, in this case, minded their business, so to speak. And this is a critical thing to teach to your kids, everybody you know. And just knowing about this alone can reduce its effects on your future situations. There's no vaccine for this, but this is as close as you can get to just understanding this. Uh, could save your life or somebody else's in the future. Greg? Yeah, I think when we look at military people, we typically think of people who run toward danger. Same with cops, same with firefighters. That's a trait that you either have when you go there or it's taught to you. You can teach yourself any of those traits. You can also teach yourself to be suspicious. My wife will tell you when I'm driving along the road and I live in rural Georgia and I see someone looking around at the trunk of their car near the edge of something, I'm like, well, that's what they got in their trunk before we go much further. So I slow down because you never know. People get thrown out all the time. So get your head clear around what is possible. Doesn't mean it's always going and don't always think people are criminals, but get your head around what is possible. I think it's natural. Chase, you say it all the time. People think other people think what they think. It's not true. This guy doesn't think what you think. You just saw it. So pay attention. Everything he says in this video is about his internal process. Nothing new. 
my gun. I stumbled over my gun. I lost my keys. You don't hear anything about was the young woman dead in the trunk or she banging and screaming because he doesn't care. He cares about his his feelings and what's going on inside his head. And he's probably in terror. And Scott, may, let's assume that we're right. The only things they feel are those adrenaline feel. Well, he's got that going right now in spades. So he probably is altogether going there. What this interviewer has done very well when you're embracing a narcissist is kind of admire him, ask him questions that make him feel good about talking. This is right in here where I might lean into him just because I enjoy getting what I want out of the conversation. I might lean in and start to do a pride and ego down and say, well, that's because you're stupid. And if anybody had any common sense, you would have been caught a long time ago. Now you get to see what's behind the mask for real. They get really angry when you prod them that way. And then finally, just as you think about looking at this guy and you think about everything he's saying here, nothing is changing body language wise. Mark, you're dead on. This is just, there's Scott, you said all the time, there's nobody in there. This looks like nobody in there. Scott, what do you got? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you hundred percent. At the top there, when he says, uh, I just killed a young woman, she isn't dead. She's dying. All these things just sound, sound odd. Everything in here is, isn't the way it should be and doesn't sound the way it should sound. I get the feeling he's talking about himself in the third person the whole time, like he watched this happen. And we, and I said that before, we've all said that before. We're not seeing the facial expressions to the extent we should be seeing them uh, on, on someone who's, who's wired properly, I guess you'd say, but he's more animated about describing how he thought he locked his keys in the trunk than he did about um, stabbing the girl. So about about or about killing either one of them, he's the most worried. I think that gave him an adrenaline rush when he thought he was going to get caught. I think he got a buzz from that, and his head's moving side to side more deeply than it has up to this point. As and like like you guys were saying, his eyebrows are up a little bit further. His cadence speeds up, and his tone is strong, and his 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 volume is up. Everything sounds like he's being excited, but we're not seeing it on him like we should be seeing it. It's really, it's really odd. It's really odd at that point. I agree with you on that. I just killed a young woman. I slammed down the lid of the trunk. She isn't dead. She's dying. And I panicked. I thought I just locked the car keys in it because I can't find them in my pocket. Oh my God, I locked them in the trunk. I'm kicking on the trunk lid and yanking on it. Oh no, I don't believe this. I started to run and I tripped over the gun that I'd had in my pants that I had totally forgotten was there. I stopped, I said, stop and think. I collected my wits, check all your pockets. I picked the gun up, I stuck it back in my pants, now remembering I had one. I checked all my pockets and there's the keys in the back pocket. I never put them in my back pocket. Everyone makes mistakes and that's what we have to hope for. The more mistakes they make, the better, better their chances. I thought I was pretty slick and went and tripped all over myself, that first two murders. The first 24 hours, there were three clear times I should have been busted, and I wasn't. Because three different individuals or three different groups of people got scared and minded their own business and looked the other way. My mother worked at the campus and I had an A sticker on my car and obvious access day or night to the campus. I was picking up some very lovely young women. You know what we were talking about as we're driving around? Almost as often as not, this guy that's going around doing this stuff. And the second they started talking that, they didn't realize it, but they were getting a free ride. I couldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole, I swear. You know, but they'd be telling me what all about this guy and they're comparing notes and speculating on what he looks like, how he carries himself, why he's doing this stuff, telling me about it. So how come they get in a car with somebody at that time? She judged me not to be that guy. I didn't look like it. It was getting easier to do. I was getting better at it. I was getting less detectable. I started flaunting that invisibility. A human head, two of them at night in front of my mother's residence with her at home, my neighbors at home upstairs, their picture window open, the curtains open. 11 o'clock at night, the lights are on. All they have to do is walk by, look out, and I've had it. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is a good one. This interviewer is feeding his ego, and he's now getting the, getting the chance to deliver the message he came to deliver. I was good at it. He's talking about the drug now, Scott. You were dead on earlier. This drug he's addicted to is adrenaline, and he's, he's talking about it now. He's talking about going in there and doing all this and 
you heard the axe he takes. He even moves to the most cliche thing I've ever seen as he starts to pontificate, as he puts his thumb and finger against his face like the thinker so he can tell you exactly what he thinks. This He came here planning for this. Look at his eyes. They're now narrow, and he's got full-blown disdain at people not being able to identify him. I think he sees people as stupid. He sees people as part of the problem. He's crowdsourcing his guilt. I'll leave it at that and say, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I think I think you're right, but but let me advocate on his behalf, if I may, a, a lesson which is important for us all, which is he's kind of correct in saying that you can't tell who somebody is from just how they look. You can't go on that first assumption. Uh, behavior and behavior analysis is not, hey, that person looks okay. We've got to know what is their behavior and we want to look at what are the big patterns of behavior. And certainly when it comes to antisocial criminal acts, just to say they're not likely to be super smart. So it's about access. It's about who's got really easy, simple access. And he gives us something really important here, which is to say, look at that sticker on the front of my vehicle. That gets me access to the people that are easy prey for me. And so that's what we've always got to look out for in behaviors. What are the stickers that these people have? What have they got access to? If we're looking for somebody who might uh, come up against us and our family, okay, who has easy access? Who's already in the vicinity? Now, that's not to be paranoid and to and to look out for your, you know, as your nearest and dearest as, as perpetrators, but do look out what are the bigger behaviors there, who has quick and simple access. Now, one last thing about this, which I think is really interesting, which again feeds this, this narcissism. If you talked about him, you got a free ride. If you said, hey, you know, there's this killer out here, like, you know, who's murdering all these kids. Like, what do you reckon to that? You get a free ride, you don't get killed. If you feed his ego, you know, as, as Scott's been calling it there, if you feed that gap, he's got a gap in him, something that needs, he's got a hunger, it needs filling, there is a void in there. And if you fill that void, you don't get killed. And that's really, uh, really key because you, if you can build his sense of self and his idea out there is my mother killed my sense of self. I don't think that's probably wholly accurate, but he's saying the void is there because of my mum. My mum's to blame. I think there may be some elements of that, but it's not the whole story. It's more complex than that. But if you fill that void, you're getting a free ride. You don't get killed. So I wonder what it was that triggered him with some of his other victims, not victim blaming here, but looking at the analysis of this, what was it that took away from him that meant this person has to be destroyed or these two people have to be destroyed? It's a possibility there was some trigger there. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right, my thought on that was he was just saying that so he would look better. I'm not so sure that that, that even happened. At that point, he may have picked somebody up and that might have been uh, the, the quote unquote road he went down, but maybe um, maybe that didn't happen. He was just trying to make himself, he created a situation where, he's, where he, it looks like he has feelings. So, but he doesn't have any, except when those things happen, he, he can feel things. I don't think he has the empathy in him to pull that off is what, is, is, is what I think. And he likes showing you he's the person that knows what's going on and he's the guy in charge and he knows things that nobody else knows like and he likes putting that on display like he does in this story he likes letting you know that and when he talks about almost getting caught he blames the three people that let him get away with it he, he blames it's their fault that that he didn't get caught it's their fault and the interviewer said, well, why did you, um, why did she get in the car with you? And he says, she judged me not to be that guy. I didn't look like him. Well, that's like when Greg was saying his fingers up here, he's doing the classic. Let me tell you something. Here's what I think. That's, that's so over the top, you know, because he doesn't know how to act. Quite often, psychopaths will watch other people behave and they'll start behaving like that, especially if there's some type of emotion Put in with it and i think he's seen somebody else do this 
and thought that was the thing to do on one of these police shows he's been watching uh, as he goes through all this. His posture straightened up, his head is pulled in, and that posture and everything happened like that. This one does that little smirk, like I know more than anyone else on any of this, which he does because he was there and did all that. But he he pauses and he holds that because he I think that's where he, he, his ego goes. Yeah, this is all about me at this point. Now I look so cool because I know all these things. All this stuff happened. Here's what I did. He gives the impression that he's special and he's not. He's just a psychopath. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I totally agree with you guys, Scott. I, I agree. I don't think this happened. I really don't think this happened. I think at this point, there's it's starting to creep in. There's a desire to be caught. I think he wants to be caught by somebody. And I think this might just be, he's talking about how they're perceiving the situation. So he's pointing at his head, maybe just referring to how they viewed something. And I'll give you an example right now on why we might hear so much of this dissociative language. And if you guys will entertain it, uh, we'll do it as a group here. Well, you just to visualize yourself the last time you took a shower. And our brains default to visualizing ourselves in third person for meaningless scenarios like that. If you visualize yourself during a recent emotional uh, encounter or maybe the last time something emotional happened, we're more likely to visualize that situation in first person. So what I'm saying is, this has no stakes. It's not a big deal. And it's something that may be potentially a little bit exciting for him, but it's still one of the situations where there's a GoPro and he's viewing that entire situation through that GoPro lens. So it's kind of a third person visualization because it wasn't a huge event. My mother worked at the campus and I had an A sticker on my car and obvious access day or night to the campus. I was picking up some very lovely young women. You know what we were talking about as we're driving around? Almost as often as not, this guy that's going around doing this stuff. And the second they started talking that, they didn't realize it, but they were getting a free ride. I couldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole, I swear. You know, but they'd be telling me what all about this guy, and they're comparing notes and speculating on what he looks like, how he carries himself, why he's doing this stuff, telling me about it. So how come they get in a car with somebody at that time? She judged me not to be that guy. I didn't look like it. It was getting easier to do. I was getting better at it. I was getting less detectable. I started flaunting that invisibility. A human head, two of them at night in front of my mother's residence with her at home, my neighbors at home upstairs, their picture window open, the curtains open. 11 o'clock at night, the lights are on. All they have to do is walk by, look out, and I've had it. Why did you keep the heads? Why did you keep them? And why did you keep them? Something out of my childhood. Um, I could put it on an incident. I mean, my father chopping the heads off of our two pet chickens and my mother insisting that I eat them for dinner. Uh, <laughs> you know, we could say it was something that simple. I don't think it was. Now, my dad heads out back with a hatchet. I got on my bike and I rode, I tried to stop it, I remember that. I got on the bike, rode around the block. I was crying. I haven't talked about that for a lot of years. I'm sure that may have implemented something, that may have gotten something rolling but along fantasy lines, but it took a lot of years of development along those lines to really get off. But how are you able to, in one minute, have someone's in your hands? And very shortly They're thereafter. Living through a fantasy, however that would relate to that head. And, and then five minutes later, I'd put that away and th there'd be a knock on the door and I'd put it away and answer the door. And the landlady would be there and we'd discuss it. Discuss what? Reality. Her reality, not mine. Some people go crazy at that point. I felt it. It was one hell of a tweak. I mean, to just flip out and not know where I was to be walking up the stairs with a camera bag that belonged to a young woman that had her in it. Walking up to my apartment past a happy young couple coming down the stairs who nodded and smiled at me as they went by. Good evening. And they're going out on a date where I'd love to be going. And I'm aware of both of these realities and the, dis the distance between those two is so dramatic, so amazing, so violent 
it really, I could feel the wheels squeaking inside. That was really pulling on it. And I imagine at that point some people break. But I didn't literally go insane. I didn't get lost. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so he's going to try to put his mask back on now. He goes to that soppy sincerity. I mean, he this is his his um, thing to trade. He comes in with us going out of his way to try to be helpful. He's telling you how it went and why it happened. When they ask him for the question about what in your history could have caused this horrendous act, he says, well, hold on, maybe I can come up with, and he goes into internal voice. One of the first times we've seen him do it, he starts thinking of an answer, and then he has a little nervous smile, nervous laugh. Even he doesn't believe it. Listen, and you can tell his cadence shifts at that recall, and you can tell this wasn't scripted. It's very different than the way your answers earlier. What he does start to say then is this thing about these chickens, and I don't believe that at all is the case. I think he's just trying to make something up, and you hear him soft pedal as he works his way along. This is his mask coming back out, and he's trying to be helpful. If I really wanted to get rid of that mask, I'd just poke on him and say, I don't believe you. I think it's innate. I think you've got a core problem. I think that you're a broken toy, and I think that your mom just made the broken toy worse. He would come unglued on you, just about guarantee. And he's six foot nine, so he's, people probably don't do much of that to him. Now, I will also say this is more of his organism. This cover has been how he's gotten here. We always say the organism does what made the organism successful. Women wouldn't have gotten in the car with him if he were clearly somebody that he's that's horrible to look at. Although people are really bad judges of character, Mark, to your point, and think, hey, that guy looks okay. That's You can never tell a serial killer. That's always the joke. You know, I'm dressing as one for Halloween. I'm just not going to wear anything different. That's how people go about it. Uh, so... We do see him do a sacred space where he covers his hands and he starts to rub. But I think that may be be real because it doesn't seem to tie in. Yeah. Meaning be real is something they shot somewhere else and they're just showing him yeah. rubbing his hands. But we call that sacred space because I take control of my space by creating a barrier and then do something that I do all the time to make it feel comfortable. Um, it, one of my favorite things he does in here is when he gets to this place where he says uh, exactly what he's talking about horror and how horrible and how tough and how close he could. He does a pause for effect, a dramatic pause. It would be like me saying, casually walking along and saying, I was having dinner with Joe Biden. And that's for effect when you do that. You're doing it intentionally. You're hoping to get a, 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 some kind of feedback. And he didn't. That's his, part of his power play. He isn't finished with power playing yet. He's trying to say, look, I went through horror. And it didn't affect me. I didn't lose it where other people would. He says, some people break, but I didn't. Hmm. I think he's enjoying his power over the situation. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, so just just going away from this video for a minute, show it like the background of what we're actually seeing here. And I think we're looking at someone who appears to have been injected with beliefs about men from a very young age. And this tremendous force, this desire to escape that, seems to have given this archetype monster that his mother installed in him even more power. And I'm not by any means an expert on this case here, but this storyline seems so honest that this is what I would assume is what we're really seeing. He became the monster that he was told he was. I'm sure he was broken to begin with. And in cases like this, we tend to see a trend exactly like this. Someone pretends to be incredibly self-aware then they take responsibility for actions and no responsibility for intent. And that's kind of what we're really seeing here. I'm taking all the responsibility for physical actions, zero for intent and, and causes. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, really interesting. Um, I could put it on an incident. I could say it was something that simple. So he even outs himself to go, it, it isn't that simple. And it isn't about the incident, about the chickens. I, I think, I think though, chickens may have had their heads chopped off somewhere in his life. As I've put here, this is not a Silence of the Lambs story. Now, why I bring that up is in that particular situation, uh, Lecter tells uh, Clarice that her whole motivation around her relationship and chasing after him is to do with an incident in her childhood around uh, oh, there goes Greg never likes me talking about uh, about Hannibal Lecter he's 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 gone off gone off to sulk about that clearly um, yeah so 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 uh, Lecter says to Clarice that um, everything motivates he's back again everything motivates back 
to to this childhood experience. Of course, the great thing is in Lecter's case, you never really hear about his background, but he uncovers her. I think this is what he's trying to do here, not because he's seen Science of the Lambs. I think this is way before probably Science of the Lambs. But it, but it's a it's a psychological trope. It's a psychological idea that you can trace everything back to one event and and go here's the cascade that comes from that. And he says it himself. I could put it down to that. We could say he's suggesting no. Don't even bother with that. It is more. Um, more complex than that. He then talks about the compartments of 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 reality. There's his reality where he's got. Uh, in fact, I won't I won't say that because I think we'll take that out of the uh, out of the video. Uh, there's his his reality where he has evidence on him of a crime, and then there's the other reality of two people's you know waving hello to him. And he talks about the massive distance between those two things. Well, unwittingly, he's absolutely telling us about the disassociation that he feels, that he cannot put these two things together. They don't live in the same place. For you and I, if we were in his position, uh, yes, we would break. We would break because we wouldn't be able to hold those two things together. We wouldn't be able to hold those two moments together of, of one very pro-social act and one very anti-social act all in one moment. It would be impossible for us to, to, to hold. He says other people would break. He says, you know, he didn't flip out. He didn't go insane. Well, maybe because you have a personality disorder in the first place and you don't really need any insanity. It's, it's such a, a strong level. You don't need to be mad to be doing what you're doing. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I think the chicken story didn't happen. And then when he adds that qualifier, I haven't talked about this in years. I think you're right, Greg. He went right back and said, what can I do here? I think I'll, uh, here's how, I'll, <clears throat> excuse me, here's how I'll do that. And the part where he's discussing uh, of reality, he's discussing the differences of reality. <clears throat> he talks about uh, that with the landlord and all that. We're not psychologists. None of us have a PhD in psychology. None of us do, have ever done, have ever been in that game. We sort of are in where we are now talking about that, but we, we're not involved in that. But after all the reading stuff I've done, this is where I, when he started talking about the differences in reality, that's why I went at the very beginning and thought, this looks like a, a paranoid schizophrenic. But he goes to show you, you know, what do I know? But that's what gave me the, the, the thought about that was, was the differences in reality as he's discussing those. And you guys have covered everything else. So I'll leave it there. Yeah, well, he was, he's was he been institutionalized since he was 15 and talked to many, many, many psychologists. And you can see he's kind of a sponge. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Why did you keep the heads? Why did you keep them? Why did you keep them? Something out of my childhood. Um, I could put it on an incident. I mean, my father chopping the heads off of our two pet chickens and my mother insisting that I eat them for dinner. Uh, <laughs> you know, we could say it was something that simple. I don't think it was. Now, my dad heads out back with a hatchet. I got on my bike and I rode I tried to stop it. I remember that. I got on the bike, rode around the block. I was crying. I haven't talked about that for a lot of years. I'm sure that may have implemented something. That may have gotten something rolling but along fantasy lines. But it took a lot of years of development along those lines to really get off. But how are you able to, in one minute, have someone's in your hands and very shortly They're thereafter? Living through a fantasy, however that would relate to that head. And, and then five minutes later, I'd put that away and th there'd be a knock on the door and I'd put it away and answer the door. And the landlady would be there and we'd discuss it. Discuss what? Reality. Her reality. Not mine. Some people go crazy at that point. I felt it. It was one hell of a tweak. I mean, to just flip out and not know where I was. To be walking up the stairs with a camera bag that belonged to a young woman that had her in it. Walking up to my apartment past a happy young couple coming down the stairs who nodded and smiled at me as they went by. Good evening. And they're going out on a date where I'd love to be going, 
and I'm aware of both of these realities and the, dis the distance between those two is so dramatic, so amazing, so violent that that really, I could feel the wheels squeaking inside. That was really pulling on it. And I imagine at that point some people break, but I didn't literally go insane. I didn't get lost. They'd buy me a beer, I'd buy them a beer. Uh, casual relationships, but that was, I was poking around a little bit trying to find some things out. I knew they wouldn't be privy to hot information, but there were some things that were bothering me, like were there any speculations on how they were dying? Did the cops like you? Like I said, a friendly nuisance. I got in the way, and it was deliberate. Again, friendly nuisances are dismissed. How did you get the knowledge to outsmart the police? Watching television, believe it or not. Joseph Wambaugh, police story. Got some tremendous insights into it. not just the gimmicks, the actual things, the tidbits that you would pick up from their procedures, but the mechanics behind that, the logic behind it was I would not allow myself to walk into even a potential trap of behavior. And one of those was talking about those crimes too much to people, initiating conversations about that. All right, Chase, what do you got? I think it's interesting here that we're hearing a person describe themselves as cunning, intelligent, self-aware, and he accidentally, I think, calls out the precise reason for his lack of responsibility for the intention of his crimes. He says he would never allow himself to be caught in a trap of behavior, which we know he is wearing a mask for this interview. But if this actual mask was actual physical, these words would be on it, a trap of behavior, because this is what he's describing his crimes are. All of these crimes are him getting caught in a trap of his own behavior, and he's calling this thing a trap of behavior. So I think that is extremely telling. I think this is maybe an unconscious revelation, something that's coming out. Greg, what do you think? Yeah, a couple of things. If you had a question about whether he has a grasp on reality, he certainly has a grasp on reality when he says that kind of thing, where a trap of behavior, because he knows that certain things get you in trouble with the cops. He is doing exactly He's showing us exactly how he behaved with the cops, that overly helpful, friendly nuisance. That's exactly the same role he tried to take with the cops. You see him putting a Trump does this when he's talking about putting a finer point on something. He does the same thing when he was talking about getting the information. It actually says I was too smart. No, you just nobody thought you were that guy. I don't know if he was that smart, but this guy gets it, understands that he's a narcissist and plays right up to him. And he just starts to play naivete and tell me more, tell me more, tell me more, which is an elicitation technique where you pretend not to understand. And people who are narcissists love to tell you more. It works every time. Scott, what do you got? Yeah. Again, I'm not a psychologist. None of us have PhDs in psychology, but I would put all my chips on him being a psychopath. That's what we're looking at. The classic clinical narcissist, everything shows up in, in from about the second or third video on. For me, that's what we're looking at. When he's talking about hanging out with the cops and, and asking questions, if you hang out with cops and there's a serial killer and they don't know you, but all of a sudden they start seeing you around and you're talking about serial killers and what's happening with the case, they're going to ask you about that. And they're going to say, yeah, they're going to talk to you. And one's going to go back and I'm going to go to the bathroom real quick. Come back and go, dude, come with me. And they go in there. This guy is asking me a lot of questions. Let's talk to him. That's what would happen. They're not stupid. He's coming on like he's smarter than everybody else. They would have put that together very quickly that he's doing that. Think about it. If, somebody, if that was your job to find serial killers, and, and that's what the most popular thing to be doing then at that time was going on, and somebody you didn't know came up and started asking about serial killers, and this guy was acting odd socially like he says he was and he's saying he was being odd and, and being a, a nuisance like that on purpose no this guy ain't colombo at all he just doesn't know how to get along with people he said that in the beginning and so i don't think they liked him I think they blew him off if he even did ask about that because if he had gone into it and had been asking questions they would have nailed him right then they would have, they would have said oh man those are red flags keep an eye on him and they would have caught him i think earlier for all that I'll let it rest there. Mark, what do you well, got? Well, one point, Scott, you might have gotten yep. away with it one time, but when you're 6'9", 
You're going to get attacked. <laughs> hey, true, Lurch has been asking <laughs> questions <laughs> around here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, very Sorry, soon it would be. Who's that that six nine guy who keeps coming in the bar <laughs> buying us all beers and talking about the murders? Yeah, it it begs belief. It's it's him having a narcissistic fantasy. Uh, it's because it's totally contradictory. Uh, I go in, I buy them a beer. I'm friendly, but I'm a bit of a nuisance. Oh, but you you don't want to fall into that trap of being the person who's kind of showing up at the funerals and you're doing exactly that. You can't have A and not A at the same time. His logic has A and not A at the same time. It's complete nonsense to feed his, that, that little gap. No, well, actually big massive gap uh, in his life. They buy me a beer, I'd buy them a beer. Uh, casual relationships but that was I was poking around a little bit trying to find some things out I knew they wouldn't be privy to hot information but there were some things that were bothering me like were there any speculations on how they were dying did the cops like you like I said a friendly nuisance I got in the way and it was deliberate again friendly nuisances are dismissed how did you get the knowledge to outsmart the police watching television Believe it or not, Joseph Wambaugh, police story. Got some tremendous insights into it. not just the gimmicks, the actual things, the tidbits that you would pick up from their procedures, but the mechanics behind that, the logic behind it, was I would not allow myself to walk into even a potential trap of behavior. And one of those was talking about those crimes too much to people, initiating conversations about that. There was a, a memorial service for two of the victims. Yes. Were you tempted to go? Yes. But? I'd uh, seen one too many episodes of one too many crime shows where that is one of the available resources for clues. Tracking down the attenders. Take one man taking pictures of the people there to eliminate as potential suspects. Some police department, now they actually came to your house to pick up a handgun. Sheriff's representatives. One of the detectives was upset because he heard I had a 44 Magnum pistol and was a convicted man. He came to take the gun away and it was on uh, he and his sergeant detective. They were staking out the wrong house. It was across the street and I'm playing around with the car, standing next to the gun in the trunk. They come over and ask me about, uh, excuse me, sir, uh, do you know who lives in this house across the street here? Well, that house was 609 Harriet. He crossed back over to this side into 609 Ord, and they were looking for me and didn't even know that, see what I mean? Bad news. Well, at any rate, we walk into the house to have them ask my mother about this other house, and I'm saying, hey, which 609 are you looking for? And they said, are you Ed Kemper? Yes, and it goes on. And uh, I needed to find out what they were looking for, the murder weapon, the 22 automatic, or the 44 Magnum, and I don't want to advertise that I've got a whole bunch of guns. Uh, so I made a comment to, to divine between the two. And uh, I said, yes, yeah, quite a little gun, isn't it? And he retorted, well, 44 Magnum, I hope so. And I said, Phew, okay, because that loaded 22 was under the front seat and guaranteed me an arrest right on the spot. And uh, 44 was in the trunk. I forgot that. I took him in the house, we went into my bedroom, and the closet doors open, and I have a high-powered rifle with a scope on it. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, just, um, there's a piece of elicitation in, in this. Uh, and, and Greg, I think you might call it a provocative statement. And, and so I just highlight it because I think it's actually quite, quite good. Uh, he uses a question, it's quite a little gun, isn't it? It's quite a little gun isn't it? And, and that elicits from uh, the police officer exactly what gun uh, is being looked for. Um, the, the, the reason why it's an interesting question is uh, it, it could go either way. It's, it's enough of a statement that's open enough that it could go either way that you could get a bit of information from that. There, that's all I got on that one. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yep, I agree with you. <laughs> and you took my... I had the same note, Damn. but let me expand on this a little bit. We, yeah. we as human beings have a natural need to correct the record. And we have a natural need to correct inaccurate information when it's presented to us. 
And that is one thing uh, in my classes I teach uh, as an example, like go find out how much someone makes for a living in a grocery store. And you walk up to that person and say like, oh, I just read an article. You guys got bumped up to $22 an hour. That's fantastic. And they're like, what? No, we're, we get fifteen fifty. So you get information, uh, sensitive information by asking less questions. And I don't think this happened. I don't think it happened. But this technique is called elicitation. If you want to learn like from the master of this, buy the book called Confidential by John Nolan. We've got, we're not going to get checks from him, uh, but I hope you get the book. It is where I uh, started my path down that course. And it was the, that book is kind of the foundation for the current intelligence operatives course that exists today. Greg? Yeah, John is the master. Um, I took his train the trainer course to be able to teach for him. He didn't allow just you to just read his stuff and teach. He's a fantastic guy. I call him one of the most dangerous people you'll ever meet because he is so casual in conversation and collects information, just wild, wild information, just like Chase just said about salaries, rate hike increases, all that kind of thing. If you've never heard of him, look him up, John Nolan. And if you can't find the book, put a note over to us, send us an email, because I know him, I know he's got some, and maybe we can get those into a box for you. Um, okay, not that we will buy the books or ship them to you, let's not mistake that, but I can point you in the right direction. I know John, know where, where to find him. Okay, so that sorry, when he says he's sorry, is a feigned sorry, sor sorrow. And you see him withdraw his lips, compressing some kind of emotion or controlling some kind of emotion well there's no chin involvement there's no no chin boss there's no grief muscle so i don't know what the hell he's covering you tell me tell me down below what you think he's covering i think he sees what other people have done and maybe that's what he's doing but his demeanor does change and he something in there i'm with you chase he increases his cadence and his cadence and his brow furrows when he's talking about this thing, it looks awkward. It doesn't look like someone really, really telling you a story that's true. And then when he says, um, I have a bunch of guns, and he's telling that whole story, there's amusement in his eyes, nothing in the lower face. That makes me think this didn't happen, Chase. I'm with you. Mark, what do you got? Uh, ben. Uh, oh, Scott, what do you got? Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. <laughs> I agree. I, th I think who showed up at his house, I think they did, is probably his parole officer. I think they were checking in on him. And I think the rest of it is because that didn't happen. Now that maybe they showed up, but I don't think they asked him about a gun. He was smart and cool enough to work his way out of that and get away with something. He keeps telling how cool he is. And this, if we go back through all these videos, don't think it happened. That's all I got. You can imagine him pulling up to pick, pick those girls up, up on the campus and be like, where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> There was a, a memorial service for two of the victims. Yes. Were you tempted to go? Yes. But? I'd uh, seen one too many episodes of one too many crime shows where that is one of the available resources for clues. Tracking down the attenders. Take one man taking pictures of the people there to eliminate as potential suspects. Some police department. Now, they actually came to your house to pick up a handgun. Sheriff's representatives. One of the detectives was upset because he heard I had a 44 Magnum pistol and was a convicted man. He came to take the gun away and it was on uh, he and his sergeant detective. They were staking out the wrong house. It was across the street and I'm playing around with the car, standing next to the gun in the trunk. They come over and ask me about, uh, excuse me, sir, uh, do you know who lives in this house across the street here? Well, that house was 609 Harriet. He crossed back over to this side into 609 Ord, and they were looking for me and didn't even know that, see what I mean? Bad news. Well, at any rate, we walk into the house to have them ask my mother about this other house, and I'm saying, hey, which 609 are you looking for? And they said, are you Ed Kemper? Yes. And it goes on. And uh, I needed to find out what they were looking for, the murder weapon, the 22 automatic or the 44 Magnum, and I don't want to advertise that I've got a whole bunch of guns. Uh, so I made a comment to, to divine between the two. And uh, I said, yes, quite a little gun, isn't it? And he retorted, a 44 Magnum, I hope so. And I said, Whew, okay, because that loaded 22 was under the front seat and guaranteed me an arrest right on the spot. And uh, 44 was in the trunk. 
I forgot that. I took him in the house, we went into my bedroom, and the closet door is open, and I have a high-powered rifle with a scope on it. I knew a week before she died, I was going to kill her. And she went out to a party, she got soused, she came home, went to sleep. I, I was woken up by that, I got, came out, I walked up to her bed, she's laying there reading a paperback, as many thousands of nights before. And she said, oh, I suppose you're going to want to sit up all night and talk now. I looked at her, I said, no. I said, good night. And I knew I was going to kill her, you know. And I'm so cold, it's so hard. And that's the first time in 10 years I've looked at it that way. I mean, that intensely, that honestly, it hurts. Because I'm not a lizard, I'm not from under a rock, I came out of see? Came out of my mother. And in a rage, I went right back in. For seven years, she said, I haven't had sex with a man because of you, my murderous son, is one of our arguments. And I humiliate her. It's so there. You know? A sick young woman dead because of the way she raises her son and the way her son is raised, the way he grows up. And what's her closing words? I suppose you want to sit up all night and talk. God, I, don't, I wish I had. Hmm? Your grandmother and her daughter-in-law, your mother, were two women very important in your life, and you killed them both. Could you say what they were like that led them to the same fate? Same thing that kept them from ever being friends. They were both aggressive, um, matriarchal women. They'd been the daughters of strong matriarchal women. I still loved my mother, and it's hard for somebody to comprehend that you murder your mother through love. It isn't a rational process. It's a very painful process. It isn't rational. And I've got to still live with that. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, now he's back to his story about the monster that created the monster. He disparages the victim. We always say that's a bad sign. I mean, he's admitting to doing it, but when a person is not admitting, often they will disparage the victim to try to push blame back on them. He just outright does. He said, she caused this problem. There's no emotion in his voice whatsoever until he gets to the point where she says something negative to him. When that happens, he rolls his eyes to try to contain emotion and then actually gets emotional. And that's around, or you just want to sit up and talk. Is that real? Possibly. Because if you pay attention to him trying to control it, his chin engaging in grief, and then it, that lower lip quivering, it looks real. But that's all about him. It's not about her. I don't think it's about feeling grief for killing her. It's about she picked on him. And that's what I think it is. Um, I don't think any of this has anything to do with her. And then he says, I'm not an animal. And then he, it's back to her. She raised me. She did this. I think we're going to find that if you got the chance to talk to him and you, and you pull the scab off and start poking, you get him pretty damn angry. If you said, look, you are an animal. And this is where it's at. Uh, finally, then when he says, I wish I had... He does a hmm sound. He does a lip compression. That's more of him masking. And then he, all he's doing is just trying to hide why he did it. I don't think he did it because of her. I think he was enraged. That probably happened. I don't think he had this moment of epiphany. I'm killing these girls because my mother. I, I, I just don't, don't see it. I think he's doing all the right words, saying all the right things. And maybe he had a moment where he had remorse and came out of it. But coming out of the cold, don't know so much. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, there, there would be one kind of analysis that goes, hey, you know, he he built up um, his getting used to or, 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 or built up his uh, relationship with the act of murder over some um, uh, some uh, young women who were surrogates for the mother and then finally got the bravery or the moment to kill the mother. And that's like a, a classic subconscious unconscious act that is uh, you know somewhat uh edible and um not quite but but it but it has that reference to the mother and uh and there he is pinocchio has cut the puppet strings and he's a real boy uh now 
Uh, but that's just all a bit too simple because he'd already killed his grandparents. <laughs> it's like he'd already done that and then gone to young women and then his his mother. No, he, he, he just isn't able to inhibit uh, his desires which is, you know, one day he wants to kill some young women, the next day it's like, no, all right, my mum. And I'm uninhibited around that. I don't think it's as grand as he makes out, though I agree, Greg, for me, there is some true emotion there. It's a big deviation from his baseline, which is almost doing nothing. And we have got hard swallow, the concern, the eye roll as part of the impersonation. I think I think the eye roll could be protecting yourself from the emotion, or it could be part of the the um, the, dis, the disdain that his mother uh, may well have showed him. But but there's and there's contempt there. Chin boss, there is some blocking. Uh, there's this fist clench that we haven't seen from him before. So, um, so it's all out of baseline. Could be deception, could be truth. I would be going, it's more on the truth. Now, does that mean, well, it kind of destroys the whole psychopath thing because there he is having, having, having feelings. No, for him, it could be rather like um, telling a joke. In that, in that you can see how how well a joke is constructed, and you might be able to laugh at it. It might be a joke at somebody else's expense, so it fits in with your narcissism. It, it, it certainly fee, um, tensions will have been built up with with society and with his mother. This is a release of of tension. It may well look like feeling and emotional to us and certainly it has some elements of that i would say but he's not building up those tensions for the same reason that you and i might he's building up those tensions for other other reasons mainly to do with himself not his mother i would build up tensions around my mother because i have a relationship with her uh, uh you know a loving relationship with her he doesn't. He doesn't. So his tensions build up for another reason. Anyway, I hope that makes sense. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, right at the beginning of this clip, there's an unusual head shake. He's nodding and then starts shaking right at the beginning, which I thought was unusual. Well, I'm not going to pretend to even know what that means, but it's definitely outside of his baseline. And the instant he covers his mouth is what looks like when someone has a spontaneous emotional recall. His eyes move down and to his right with you know, perfect unison with the rest of his body movement. And there's a mixture of contempt and anger for his mother, and it gets even stronger. The more he's putting himself into the present moment of this memory, it, the contempt and the anger get stronger and stronger. And there's a, there's a slight tongue jut in this video right at the word paperback right when she's talk or he's saying she's reading a paperback as she always does because that's stupid of course because nobody should be doing that because that's what bad people do and we see that distaste wanting to to spit it out so to speak so this is a a rare video where you're going to see this actual emotional breakdown and i think that fear and anger are almost one in the exact same emotions. And I think we're seeing those at the same time here. So typically one of my college professors in psychology said that all patients will either have emotions rooted in love or emotions rooted in fear. And everything is a derivative of those two things. Some people need more or less of one or the other. And, you know, we're seeing that here for sure. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. I see what you're saying about the beginning and that head thing. I think that's when he sees that path that he's going to go down and talk about his mother. I think that because I think I think maybe the stress starts building on just a little bit. That's why that it increases a little bit more because we haven't really seen that. You're right up to this point. His voice tone, his diction, his timbre, everything seems normal compared to his baseline, everything we've seen up to this point. And then he breaks like that. I think you're right, Chase. I, uh, that, that we're seeing all the things that say that's real and i think it's about himself and and to your point mark it's about a stress release as well all that pent-up stress here's the part i found interesting and and i can see why he would say this but he said um his mother referred to him as her murderous son i think and as you go as as, as 
training detectives and training police officers as you go, you get to know them, and you, you talk to them, and you see how they start solving these problems they come into. And it'll be sometimes the, the weirdest things, how they'll put together, put things together. But it sounds to me, if I was going to think along those lines, I think she called him out on it. I think she said, you're probably the one killing all these people because it was so easy for him to kill his grandparents. And it was no big deal for him to do that once he had felt. I think during this conversation that they had, when she was calling him her murderous son, she said he did, she did that a lot. I bet she finally got around to saying, and I'll bet you the guy killing all these girls. I'll bet you that. that that's what I think happened. And that's why I think he killed her. I think he became enraged at that point once he once he she threatened to tell on him. And I think that's why I got so mad and ended up doing the, the things that he did, did to her. That's my opinion. That's what I would think from from just being analytical and just trying to be um, logical about the, the progression of something like that, because I don't think he would go out and do all this other stuff and then finally come in and kill his mom. I think something had to instigate that. And I think that was her threatening him uh, that instigated it. Although he did, the odd thing is he turned himself in later, which we'll talk about in here in just a couple minutes. I knew a week before she died, I was going to kill her. And she went out to a party. She got soused. She came home, went to sleep. I was woken up by that. I got, came out. I walked up to her bed. She's laying there reading a paperback. As many thousands of nights before. And she said, Oh, I suppose you're going to want to sit up all night and talk now. I looked at her. I said, no. I said, good night. And I knew I was going to kill her. You know? And I'm so cold. It's so hard. And that's the first time in 10 years I've looked at it that way. I mean, that intensely. That honestly. It hurts because I'm not a lizard I'm not from under a rock I came out from see came out of my mother and in a rage I went right back in for seven years she said I haven't had with a man because of you my murderous son is one of our arguments I and I'm and I humiliate her so there, you know, a six young woman dead because of the way she raises her son and the way her son is raised, the way he grows up. And what's her closing words? I suppose you want to sit up all night and talk. God, I, don't, I wish I had. Hmm? Your grandmother and her daughter-in-law, your mother, Two women, very important in your life, and you killed them both. Could you say what they were like that led them to the same fate? Same thing that kept them from ever being friends. They were both aggressive, um, matriarchal women. They'd been the daughters of strong matriarchal women. I still loved my mother, and it's hard for somebody to comprehend that you murder your mother through love. It isn't a rational process. It's a very painful process. It isn't rational. And I've got to still live with that. Why did you wind up giving yourself up? It had to stop. It had to stop. Uh, once my mother was dead, there's almost a cathartic process at that point. I got physically ill right then, when she died, when I murdered her. And once she was dead, there was no way I could back out. I had backed down from giving up a thousand times. I just used to get drunk and go sit out in front of the sheriff's department in a parking lot across the street on one of those old concrete parking berms. And I just sit there and say, no, I still can't. The clanging doors, I can still hear them. No, because it'll never open again. You know, so I, I, I uh, rationalized that to give up would be insane. To give up would be crazy. I'd be giving away my freedom and I don't need to. But I look back on that and wish I had earlier when I was saying those things to myself. The people who were later dead wouldn't be. The regret that came later would have not had to be. Those people, not things, those people would still be with their families, with their loved ones, 
they would have their own families. If I had had the courage to make that decision, instead of painting myself into the corner. Where might you be if you'd never given in to the impulse to murder? Where might I be? If my parole had been successful, uh, I believe I'd be married, I'd have children, I'd be heading toward my first grandchildren. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so he signals towards regret and he signals towards uh, people being people and not things anymore. So what are we to make of that? Is it uh, antisocial personality disorder reformed by the prison uh, system? Well, of course, there's a whole industry around that. There's a whole industry uh, about going into prisons and uh, and helping people out who have these personality disorders. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't want to malign a whole industry that, that it wouldn't be uh, a possibility. Or, or is it is this person uh, been through that system, has got enough vocabulary together and is putting that forward. And what we have here is still uh, a child that throws murderous tantrums and more and more because it's not just about grandparents and, and parents. Uh, it's more than that. Uh, but it does finally end in this this murderous tantrum that he that he throws. Uh, I'm not going to say which one I which one it is. It could be either one of either one of those. I think it's probably the second one. But uh, Chase, what do you think? What do you got? Yeah, I think this is the case of the dog that kills its abusive owner, but now has nothing there to continue to feed it. And he, I don't think he knew what to do without her, and he kind of became the monster that she always told him that men were, that he was calling him a murderer his whole life. Uh, that stuff soaks in, especially when it's from an authority figure. Whether you like him or hate him, that stuff soaks into our skin. And I'm not blaming this all on her at all. I mean, he's got all kinds of issues on his own. But the mom certainly helped. Uh, when we study placebos and how they affect the human body and the brain, what is said makes a big difference about the placebo, the appearance of the doctor, whether or not the it's a pill or an injection and what color the pill is. There's a hundred layers that play into this, but I think that lends itself to understanding why he might have turned himself in, is that he didn't have that force anymore. He didn't have that thing anymore in his life. That's it. He didn't know what to do. Greg? Yeah, I just have one line that I'll add a little bit to it. He says people, not things. Mark, that's therapy talk. I mean, this guy probably never heard those words before until somebody said, you can't treat people like things. But this guy's smart enough to pick up that and take it and run with it. More complex, I will say, human beings are layers and layers and layers of things. What happened when he was a kid? Who knows? We'll get to that later. But here, the one thing to, to note is he was living in his mother's house, I believe. If you're living in your mother's house and she's suddenly gone, you might turn yourself in because you don't have somewhere to live. I don't know his story. I don't think he's this altruistic creature who suddenly came up with, hey, I need to go turn myself in. Maybe he felt remorse, but, and maybe he just felt like a dead end. No idea. Don't care. All we seem to now is this is not a normal kind of a creature. Scott, what do you got? I want to go back to the logic of detectives and police officers. I, I don't think it has anything to do with, with anything emotional with it all. I think he flipped out and killed her. And when he did that, all of his victims up to this point, besides his grandparents who he got caught for, so they caught him, I thought, where is he going to put her? What is he going to say? He has no story. He has no nothing. There's going to be blood everywhere. It's going to be a horrific scene. He has no, what is he going to do? Say, oh, she's out of town? Something like that? <laughs> no. And especially since he's on parole, they're going to check into that. And they're going to look in that room. They're going to look all over that house and see where she is when she doesn't show up after a while. So I think he knew he was going to get caught. And that's why he turned himself in, because they would be on him. Maybe not really, maybe not that week, but in a month and a half, two months, when nobody's heard from her, her friends, work, all that, where is she? Prove it. That's when he's going to get in trouble. So I think I'm going to follow the logic of of detectives and say that's that's what i think would have would have happened and that's why he turned himself in because he knew there was no way out of it at this point why did you wind up giving yourself up it had to stop it had to stop uh once my mother was dead there's almost a cathartic process at that point i got physically ill right then 
when she died, when I murdered her. And once she was dead, there was no way I could back out. I had backed down from giving up a thousand times. You know, I just used to get drunk and go sit out in front of the sheriff's department in a parking lot across the street on one of those old concrete parking berms. And I just sit there and say, no, I still can't. The clanging doors, I could still hear them. No, because it'll never open again. You know, so I, I, I uh, rationalized that to give up would be insane. To give up would be crazy. I'd be giving away my freedom, and I don't need to. But I look back on that and wish I had earlier, when I was saying those things to myself. The people who were later dead wouldn't be. The regret that came later would have not had to be. Those people, not things, those people would still be with their families, with their loved ones. They would have their own families. If I had had the courage to make that decision, instead of painting myself into the corner. Where might you be if you'd never given in to the impulse to murder? Where might I be? If my parole had been successful, uh, I believe I'd be married, I'd have children, I'd be heading toward my first grandchildren. Let's throw it around the room and talk about what we think we've seen and wrap it up as quickly as we can. And uh, Mark, why don't you go first? Yeah, I'll go back to it again. This isn't a, a, a simple Silence of the Lambs film. It's more complex. Uh, there's more going on here. He's trying to pretend it's super simple and he's crazy smart, uh, but it's none of none of that. So lovely, lovely to see some great stuff in there. Go back over it again. Take a look. Lots to learn out of this one. Chase, what do you think? Yeah, I think with the mom, this is a case of if I can't win your love, I'll win your submission. And I think that's what we're seeing here, with, especially with that relationship. And there's a writer named uh, Margaret Atwood who wrote about this. And I think she described the two-sided weirdness that we're seeing here pretty well. And I remember reading this in a book about confidence and discipline. If I get the title, I'll put it in the description. But she said, men are afraid that women will laugh at them. Women are afraid that men will kill them. And I think that really speaks to some depths of this layer upon layer that Greg was talking about. Greg? And Chase, just, sorry, just to uh, highlight that, I ducked down like this because I have line of sight to her house right now. That's a cool thing. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <clears throat> that is a cool she thing. She has bars on the window, so she's a little bit paranoid. <laughs> sorry, Greg. <laughs> when you're a hammer, when you hammer, everything looks like a nail, as they say. Yeah. So, yeah, we all have that. It's the reason I check where when I see people on the side of the road, right? It's in my nature. Yeah. So, look, this guy is a complex creature, as you are. You don't have any idea what your parent did when you were six years old because you not like green beans. Don't know. Anything can impact you. The difference is that at some point, most of us go, okay, hold on. How do I fix that broken piece of me? Some people just go to be full-blown broken toys. This guy did. And if all you are is a broken toy, your meaning goes away. You still got to be a broken toy. You still got to go and tell everybody what a broken toy you are somehow. I think that's what we're seeing here. I think this soppy sincerity that he shows to get people to listen to him is so he can do more of what he's always done. And that's <clears throat> instill some kind of creepy fear or terror in people. And I'm not a fan. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you. And I think we're seeing, I think it's a great example of seeing a psychopath when they're watching them grow, watching them go through life and the things that, that they do as they go through life. When he was little, he was, he was mean to animals and he killed his grandparents later on. I guess, what was he, 15 year old, 15, 15. years old or something like yeah. that? Yeah. And then he gets, so he gets out of prison and then that behavior continued. Well, for a little while, then that behavior continued. I think we're seeing someone who had outbursts of, of rage and that's when he killed his mother. Because he talks about rage, he talks about anger, he talks about these pent up things that happen before he kills these people. And I think that's what it was. And maybe, yeah, I'm sure he hated his mom. I'm sure he hated everybody. Anybody that had anything to do with brushing up against that ego like you do with a psychopath and they will get you back. So you have to be real careful with that. When, when you, if you spot one or, or, or aware that someone is one, and like I said before, I'm not a psychologist, don't have a PhD in that, none of us do. But from what I've, I've read and from what I understand, that would be my opinion only that this guy's a psychopath and that's what we're seeing. I think she hit that ego and she said she was gonna tell on him. And I think he, he killed her at that point. 
All right. I think this is a good one, fellas, and we'll see you next time. So what do you got?